Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel and to another explore. In this video, we're taking the time to visit Corbridge Roman Town. We get to explore the preserved and impressive ruins of a Roman garrison located on Hadrian's Wall, teamed up with a visit inside a museum full of fascinating excavated artefacts. So join us for a wonder. There's a lot of history packed into this small site here at Corbridge. There were Roman forts here for several centuries, and they all played a pivotal role in Roman control over what is now northern England. There are four forts superimposed one on top of the other, with a later legionary supply base and a large civilian settlement on top of that. The complex range of Roman buildings makes Corbridge one of the most fascinating Roman sites in England. Corbridge Roman Town is the only place in Britain where you can walk along the original surface of a Roman high street, flanked by the excavated remains of granaries, a fountain, markets, workshops and temples. A display inside the museum showcases the Corbridge Hoard, one of the most significant finds from Roman Britain. Buried in the early 2nd century and rediscovered in the 1964, this chest contained an extraordinary collection of weapons, tools and personal possessions. Most importantly though, it also included articulated Roman armour. The collection at Corbridge is the largest of Hadrian's Wall's collections, with a staggering 34,000 finds. Among these finds is the infamous Corbridge Lion, found all the way back in 1907. If you hang on till later, at the end of the video, we take a short wander inside to show you. The town was originally named Coria, which was a Celtic word meaning hosting place. The town started its life as a fort to control the Tyne, crossing over the main invasion route into Scotland, and it was garrisoned for almost 40 years before the building of Hadrian's Wall, which began on higher ground to the north. Sitting astride the intersection of Roman Deer Street and Stainegate, Corbridge was initially the site of a series of important forts. But after Hadrian's Wall was fully commissioned, it developed into a prosperous town, as a tempting leave centre for off-duty wall garrisons. Though it is often considered part of the Hadrian's Wall's defences, Corbridge actually began much earlier. The first fort in the Corbridge area was built in AD 79 at what is now Red House Farm, less than a mile to the east. This first fort was used to aid the invasion of southern Scotland by Agricola. Around AD 86, the fort was abandoned and a new fort was built at the present site, which offered a good location for a bridge across the river. The first troops to be stationed here at Corbridge may have been the Alia Petriana, an elite cavalry regiment. The first century fort was rebuilt several times over the following century and was subsequently used to house troops during the building of Hadrian's Wall, approximately two miles to the north. And in AD 105, the fort burned to the ground, possibly after an attack by northern tribes. It was then rebuilt to form part of the Stainegate line of fortifications across the Roman frontier. Corbridge then served as a supply base for Antoninus Pius's invasion of Scotland due to its location on the major north-south route known as Deer Street. The Romans rebuilt the original timber bridge across the Tyne around AD 160 and during the following decade the 20th and 6th legions were stationed at Corbridge. The legions helped garrison the forts along Hadrian's Wall and north along Deer Street. Corbridge acted as a major supply base and a market area for the northern fringes of Roman territory. During this phase, the granaries were expanded and a huge warehouse erected. 
The old defences were torn down to make way for new buildings, and the earlier forts were transformed into a huge legionary supply base, known to archaeologists as Site XI, or 11 in Roman numerals. At the heart of this new supply base was a courtyard building considered the largest single Roman building visible in Roman Britain. This courtyard building, on an unprecedented scale, was never actually finished, probably due to unrest on the northern frontier during the late 2nd century. And sometime around AD 180, a devastating fire hit Corbridge, and the expansion of the site stopped. It is possible that the fire was an accident, but it may have also been due to an attack from the north, with barbarian tribes trying to break through Hadrian's Wall. From the late 2nd century, a large town grew up around the fort, with shops, townhouses and communal baths. By the 3rd century, Corbridge was now a community. As the town grew in importance, the military presence declined. As late as AD 370, the main street through the town was rebuilt. And to make town life successful and thriving, you would have needed everyday people, ranging from blacksmiths to cooks and these people would graft to make the products to sell on these very ruins. They would have done so from the buildings that we wander around today. In usual design or layout, the shop would have been at the front, right on the high street. Then at the back would have been a workshop, and normally above, a dwelling space for the families that would have lived here. The town continued in use until the departure of the Romans from Britain in the early 5th century, which was then quickly abandoned. A Saxon settlement was established to the east around AD 670. The Saxons robbed stones from the Roman site for centuries, and the Roman stones were used to build St Wilfrid's Church in Hexham. In the early 13th century, King John, who was always a man with an eye for money, had his men dig at Corbridge in search of treasure, but they found nothing but carved stones bonded with metal cramps, and soon gave up. King John's search was haphazard by the standard of archaeologists, but thankfully much of the site has now been properly excavated, revealing a range of buildings, including the granaries, a fountain house, barracks, temples, an aqueduct, and houses for both civilians and military. And these excavations unearthed one of the largest and most diverse collections of Roman artefacts anywhere in Britain. The large granaries were finally rebuilt in the early 3rd century, when new compounds were built for legionary detachments from the 2nd Legion Augustus. The westernmost granaries are the best preserved in Britain, complete with underfloor ventilation and raised flooring. As we wander around it, I read that it was more than likely built under Septimus Severus, the Roman Emperor from AD 193 to 211 and the first African-born emperor who grew up in Leptis Magna on the coast of modern-day Libya. To keep all of the contents of these two grain stores cool and dry, the floors were raised above a ventilated basement. Coins were found here in a considerable numbers 
and it showed that the granaries were still in use in the late 14th century, but it would have been operated by civil authorities at the time, who collected tax in the form of the grain and maintained a food supply for the townspeople. Near the granaries was a large public fountain, which was fed by an aqueduct. You can still see this settling tank for the water and the aqueduct channel that brought the water to the fountain. The fountain gave life and sparkle to the bog standard stale water by cascading it into an open tank and then from there into a public trough. Perhaps the most impressive find was discovered in 1964 when the archaeologists uncovered a wooden chest bound with leather and iron. Inside this chest was an incredible collection of weapons, armour and tools. The highlight was two suits of plate armour, the best preserved examples of segmented plate armour in Britain. Other items inside the box, which some are actually displayed in the museum, include a spear, a pickaxe, knives and random items varying from a horse's harness to gaming counters and textiles. Most of the hoard box shows part of worn and damaged items, possibly awaiting repair and further use, but they were concealed and buried, which makes you think that they might have expected to return and retrieve the items, but they never did. Another important item in the museum is the Corbridge Lion, a magnificent stone carving of a lion attacking a deer. The lion was originally carved to decorate a grave, but it was later reused as a fountain in a large house, with the lion's teeth drilled away to fit a water pipe to run the water through it and create a centrepiece. What I enjoyed about learning and seeing around the museum was the everyday items that people would have used. There are many displays of personal items from the 3rd and 4th century town, which gives us a fantastic idea on how people may have looked in Corbridge around that time. There are combs, rings, bracelets, makeup palettes, hairpins and mirrors, as well as cosmetic implements like tweezers and perfume flasks. And all this makes sense and highlights that physical attraction was more important then, as it is nowadays too. Daily life meant that the people of Corbridge needed to make their own fun, and on display you can see the remains of a gaming board, dice and counters, which I find quite fascinating. There really is so much to explore, enjoy and understand here at Corbridge and it's the perfect place if you're interested in Romano-British culture. It's incredible to be in the footsteps of Roman soldiers who once built and laid the roads here some 2000 years ago. And some of the remains make you feel like this is a ruin of a couple of hundred years ago, not a couple of thousand. The workmanship of the masons, the planners and the builders Knowing that these were also elite fighting men is something hard to take in. From the ruins and plans of this site, it's clear to see how the fort was laid out, but it can be quite intimidating as you first see the ruins, but it really does make sense once you're exploring all of the areas. They also have a thoughtfully laid out museum, which I mentioned has plenty to see, and has interactive pieces for the kids to enjoy. We think this is one gem not to miss, especially in Northumberland's historic area. So we hope you've enjoyed the video as much as we did filming and exploring here. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button, consider joining our Patreon, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, or joining us here on channel memberships. We want to say a big thank you to those supporting us, and we truly appreciate you. So we'll see you on the next one. Till next time.